Fine Institute getting ready to perform our third surgery of the day. This young lady is having three discs repaired with a Duke laser disc repair. She has herniations at all three and she has a spondylolisthesis at one of the discs. Are you okay? I'm gonna give you some numbing medicine, all right? So I get the question quite often. So left side, which is where I am, three, four, four, five, correct? Correct. Yeah. I'm gonna numb up her skin because we're gonna be making an incision in just a moment. And I'm, uh, and right side is four, five, five, one? Yes, sir. Oh. So I'm gonna numb up again her back. She's nice and relaxed. Dr. Berndez. Well, she was. All right, you're fine. I've given her eight cc's of local. So we use local anesthetic to numb things up so it doesn't bother the patient as much when we uh, make the skin incision or when we go in with a needle. Now, the biggest issue here is L45, as far as I'm concerned. L45 is in bad shape. And you can see on the x-ray, show them, Jordan, the spondylolisthesis. It's a grade um, one to two. It's right on the border of a grade two. Now everyone thinks, oh, spondylolisthesis, you need fusion, but you don't. We have been successfully able to treat spondylolisthesis symptoms, which actually come from nerve impingement and the annular tear successfully with the laser surgery now and I've done hundreds of patients with spondylolisthesis. So not everybody wants a fusion. And as long as I'm able to eliminate her pain in her back and her leg shot with this um, procedure, then there's no reason to do a fusion. Are you awake? How are you doing? Now, if you look at her MRI, you'll see that at L45, there's a massive disc herniation in the foramen on both sides. I need an AP. Are you comfy? Yeah. All right, so my job here, my goal is to get into L45 on both sides so that I can remove the herniated disc that's sitting in the neural foramen. That looks good. Go back to a lateral. You can actually see the PARS defect. There's what's called a gill body there. Uh, where do you feel that? Where do you feel that, sweetheart? In your back? Yeah. Or down your leg? Mm -hmm. Back or your leg? Is it going down to your, just your back, right? Yeah, but I'm not even in the foramen. Why are we getting all this feedback on the mic, guys? I hear noise. All right, let's make an incision. I was cleaning the mic, Doc. Don't do that, please. You just lay still, okay? All right, so we're going to make our incision. We're going to place our second needle at 3-4. So it's left side three, four, four, five. Everyone agree? Thanks. Shot. A three, four will be a little bit easier to access because it's a much more normal level, except for the herniation. Don't move. Let's have some num num. Okay. Just relax. You're doing fantastic. You all right? Doing great. Doing doing good. We're going to numb her up a little bit as we do this. So this is numbing medicine we're injecting into the right. muscle and fascia. Thank you All right. Well, you're doing great. Don't move. You're doing great. Yeah, just lay still. I need you to be still, okay? <laughs> Shot. So we're using the x-ray here to navigate to 3-4. And what a difference, huh, between L3-4 and L4-5? 
Can you show everybody three, four? Jordan? Yeah, look at the giant foramen at three, four. And compare it to four, five, the level below. Much different. But so far, so good. Shot? So we know she has a herniated disc here. I actually feel it right here. I'm bouncing on it. You okay? She's a little sleepier. All right, so AP, I'm happy because we're way below the exit of the nerve root, which would be the L3 nerve root. We're just lateral to the L4 nerve root, which is traversing. So we're gonna do an AP view, check our needle position. It's absolutely perfect at 3-4. Honestly, 3-4 in terms of, you lay still, you're doing great. Just stay still, everything's fine. Yeah, that's one of your bad discs. Shot, I already put it. So just, uh -huh. what'd she say? Uh, you're great, shot. Almost, almost going to put you to sleep soon. I just need a few more minutes to work. Oh, that's good. Shot? You're doing great. Just relax. Yeah, you're doing great. Just relax. So this is the hard level at 4-5. I'm right at the back of that disc, and I'm right at the back of L5. I need to just get right over the hump there. There's like a little hump. Shot? That's the spot, yeah, I know. I need you to, to lay still so I can finish what I gotta do. <laughs> You're doing good, just lay still. All right. So I'm right there. Um, honestly, if she just relaxes a little bit more, I could probably get it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move on to the other side and give her a chance to relax a little. You're doing good, just relax. Stay still. You're doing great, hold your hand here. So on the other side, we're gonna do four, five, and five, one. I've already numbed her up with Novocaine on this side and first thing I'm going to do is go down to 5-1 shot okay it's good you just lay still you're doing good all right any questions from our audience yes we have a question from Jay Whiteside 91 on YouTube He's asking num num, is that the technical term? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Yes, num num num. That is uh <laughs> that's my term. You're gonna get the patient all worked up here. Um yeah, so num num obviously is numbing medicine. Um Yeah, and so uh it is a mixture of uh, lidocaine and marcaine. Let's get an AP view. And maybe a little epinephrine, right? No? no? So. Just lidocaine okay. and marcaine. Actually, the num num doesn't have lidocaine and marcaine, but the skin does have epinephrine. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the num num has lidocaine and marcaine only. Correct. Skin has a little epinephrine. <laughs> All right, so yeah, let's go back to a lateral. Okay, so I need to be more lateral. It's really what it comes down to. And to do that, I'm gonna just do that. Shot, just lay still. There we go, perfect. So I just redirected. Shot, are you okay? Is she uh, reliable? She's reliable, she says. Shot, she says. Shot. That's what I want. I want to be a little more inferior and a little more 
um, lateral and now we're good so we should be able to access 5-1 through the foramen I can feel the herniation it starts right where the tip of that needle is at the bottom so let's get one more AP view just to make sure I'm happy with the AP which is anterior posterior it's a front back view remember I'm navigating these needles to the tear and herniation using an x-ray machine that looks really good lay still you're doing good you're in a dream so while I'm working here my anesthesiologist is managing her breathing and anesthetic level this is really good I'm happy with 5-1 shot yeah where do you feel that shot I'm moving around a little too much Shot. Shot. Big tear. Big tear there. That needle went in. The needle shouldn't go in that easy. I've gotten used to the feeling of a tear in the annulus, and that thing just went in. So I think when we do our discogram at 5 1, you're going to see like a lot of. Um, die just leaking out very easy through a big tear now normally when you do a discogram in a normal disc there shouldn't be any dye leakage it, it stays in the center as what we call a cotton ball and that's because it looks like a cotton ball a little black cotton ball so I don't think we're gonna see cotton ball 5-1 we're gonna see a big tear now for her, her MRI that you guys are seeing that Flynn has put up is not really showing the herniation at 5-1 because it's showing you the herniation at 3-4 and 4-5 on the left but we're not really showing you 5-1 and the reason for that is um, the 5-1 herniation just lay still the 5-1 herniation is uh, is on the right side shot and since we're showing you that MRI we're only showing you one side because we only have one picture. And you had to choose left or right. You're doing great. Don't move. Shot. I'm getting my, my hand radiated a bit. Shot. Um, shot. All right, so that's looking good right there. I feel all the scar tissue, by the way, um, I used to treat this condition that she has with fusion, AP. And I would literally do uh, opening here and dissect all the muscles off the spine. And what you'd find down at this listhesis area in the posterior elements where the facets are, you'd actually find a massive amount of scar tissue. That looks pretty good. And that scar tissue is just from years and years of inflammation and instability you're doing good lay still all right so this four five is I feel the herniation shot. Well, what I want to avoid is this needle lifting. You feel that in your back shot? I'm right inside the herniation. I can feel it. Yeah, well, that's her bad disc. Shot? We did it. It's there. Yeah, you're doing great. Just hang in there. Almost done. That's your bad disc. Now I gotta maneuver the other one. Oh, shot. All right, that's what I thought. Thank you for pointing that out. Shot. All right, so what I got to do is get over that lip. 
so close. Try to relax. You're doing really good. I may just have to pull back and re-engage. Shot. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come back just a little bit and re-engage. Shot. There we go. Shot. What is she asking? It's Dr. Duke. I'm working on getting us right where we need to be. Shot? I think I might have gotten some progress there. Definitely progress. Shot? All right, so we're sitting right now. We've moved past the back of five. Now we're bumping against the back of four on the listhesis. I don't know if you guys can appreciate that. Show them the tip of the needle at four so they can see what I'm talking about. That's it right there. So it's bumping against the back of the vertebral body of four, but I'm inside the herniation, so that's good. And then show them the needle on the other side, the right side. Yep. All right. Are you comfy? Let me have a little dog. Don't move. Shot. 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 AP. She must be on some good stuff. Really good stuff. Really good stuff. What are you what are you taking for your pain? Oh. Trust me, there's more than just aspirin and clonazin. All right, go back to a lateral. Right? You agree? Yes? No? Yeah. How bad is that? On a scale of 1 to 10, what's the highest it went? How high did it go? Ten. Ten. All right. So anyway, she, um, we got a good pain response at four or five. Ten out of ten. So I'm not quite in the disc at four or five yet. Um, on the left, just lay still. We're gonna be ready to put her to sleep soon. Shot. How bad is that on a scale of one to 10? All right, let's go ahead and put her to sleep. All right, so. Our, our, I feel our discogram is not reliable because of whatever she's taking has uh, sort of affected. But we got a good one at 4.5, which is a 10 out of 10. And 5.1 and 3.4, I'm not really sure. I couldn't really get a good response. But clearly you can see there's tears, huge tears at both discs with herniation and that's what we're going to go fix so without further ado let me know when i can proceed yeah unreliable discogram um but uh put grade um grade four tear at, at l34 and l5s1 and a grade five tear at l45 all right, we'll start with uh, L34. 
three, four. We've already made our incision. So at this point, we're gonna bring the dilator down over the guide wire. We know the guide wire has a safe path down to the herniation at L3-4 shot. And you can actually see the herniation. Um, Jordan, you wanna show the audience the L3-4 herniation? I'm about to encounter it. Yep, right there. It's bulging out. Show them the tear in the back of the disc. Yes, that big black thing is the tear. It's full of dye and that's why it's black on the x-ray. Shot? So now I'm bumping against the herniation and you can see it, she's not happy, right? So this is actually the, the, the test that was done by Cloward, a famous spine surgeon about in the 1960s when he had patients and he, was, he would touch the back of a painful disc like this with a metal object and he said that they would respond to pain just like she is. Lay still. And he took that as the disc can be painful. But he was the first surgeon to identify the disc can be painful. And um, the first one to kind of do a human experiment on it during his surgery. Yeah, you can actually find his paper. I forgot the year it was published, but he talks about um, pushing on the back of a painful disc and figuring out, he like pushed on the back of the the vertebral body, there was no pain response. He pushed on the back of the, um, a bunch of different structures, the nerve root, the dura, and none of them caused back pain except for pushing on the back of the disc. All right, lay still, you're doing great. So clearly this is a bad disc for her. Even though she didn't respond on the, as much on the discogram, uh, she gave us a number four, but it's clearly higher than that. All right, tell me when I can proceed. We'll wait for her to get a little more comfortable. All right, in the meantime, do we have any questions, chat? Yes, we have a question from Sear on Facebook. Is the disc protruding the same as a herniated disc? Also, does this laser surgery help with foramenal stenosis? Yeah. All right, this, this is a great time to talk about it. So what's the difference uh, between a bulging disc, protruding disc, herniated disc? They're all the same. They all start with a tear. Show them the tear in the back of the disc again. Look for the white arrow on the x-ray. Can you go to the x-ray, Flynn? Do you see yes, the white sir. arrow? Yes, we do. All right, so the first thing that happens is people get a tear in the back of their disc. Then the jelly from the center pushes through the tear. And if it's a small protrusion of jelly, it's called a bulge or a protrusion. If it's really big, they call it a herniation. There's really no distinguishing based on size or characteristics. It's just they're all the same. Herniated disc, bulging disc, protruding disc, extruded disc, ruptured disc, uh, extravasated disc. They're pretty much all the same thing. How are we doing, guys? Doctor? All right. How is her shoulder? Are we okay? Shot? All right, you're doing fine. Lay still. So obviously this is a painful disc for her. Uh, obvious to me. Shot? Um, one of the challenges that we as doctors have in managing patients, especially anesthesia, is when they take uh, substances that we're not aware of, shot, and they're not reported to us, shot, and we end up trying to do, you know, give them medications that may have an interaction with those other substances. And then the actual anesthesia becomes a little more unpredictable. Right, Dr. Berndes? So we're doing our very best to keep her happy. Um, but these, the reason we're here is she has painful discs. That's what we're here to fix. So, all right, let me have a towel. I need my wrist uh, ray tech.
Here. Everybody ready? We're going to get started without further ado. Now we're inside the L34 disk, and what I'm seeing is nucleus propulsus, blue, stained blue by our dye. It means that it's degenerated. Normal nucleus propulsus doesn't stain blue. Only degenerated nucleus propulsus stains blue. So clearly already we have an abnormality here. Lights off, please. Which we knew because we saw the tear and we, we knew this is a painful disc. So this is not an, what a normal disc looks like. It looks white. Hold on, I gotta try to fix the focus. The focus doesn't seem to want to focus very well. Maybe it's the blue dye leaking out. All right, we ready? So this is a soft herniation, meaning it's new. It's not an old herniation, this is a newer herniation. Old herniations are calcified, they're hard, they're scarred up, and this is not an old herniation. If I had to date this so far, I'd, I'd put it within two years. I haven't seen the entire disc yet. As I progress, I'll see more and I'll be able to give you a, hopefully a better opinion on it. But right now, this is a fresh, fresh herniation. She doing okay? Zach. Yes. We have a question from YouTube. From All Harvard. right. He has three questions. I'll start with the first one. Will this procedure allow the disc to return back to its normal size? Great question. Will this procedure uh, allow the disc to return back to its normal size? The answer is no. There is no procedure available in the world that will allow the disc to go back to the normal size. Once the tear occurs and the jelly squeezes out, you can never put it back. You'll never have a normal looking disc. Um, think about a tube of toothpaste, okay? If you take the cap off your toothpaste, a brand new tube of toothpaste, and you squeeze the toothpaste out through that hole, will you ever get the toothpaste back in? The answer is no, you won't. Um, you could try to suck it up and squeeze it back in. But once the toothpaste comes out, it starts to dry up and get chunky. And that's kind of what happens to this disc. It gets abnormal once it started to degenerate and we're trying to remove the abnormal part but you can't put it back in there is no synthetic disc available today <clears throat> the closest you can come to a normal looking disc after a bad disc injury is to take a dead person cut the disc out of their spine and transplant it into your spine and of course that's not allowed to be done in the united states but they're experimenting on it in other countries now would i ever recommend that absolutely not because no matter what you're going to have a reaction an immunological reaction to that that bone and disc that's being transplanted so it's like any other transplanted tissue from a donor is you're going to have to be on suppressive doses of steroids autoimmune, I mean immune suppression therapy in order to get the graft to take. And even then, I don't think it will take successfully, but it's been done once experimentally over in Asia. And uh, I don't see that as becoming very popular. <laughs> there's no need for it. So to answer your question correctly, there's no surgery in the world that makes the disc back to normal. And what your goal is with surgery is to get rid of the symptoms for the patient long term. So to eliminate the back pain, eliminate the leg pain, eliminate weakness, numbness, tingling in the legs that come from a herniated disc. That's the goal. And this surgery you're watching right now is the absolute best surgery in the world for doing that. It also happens to be the least invasive.
That's because we're not fusing or putting an artificial disc. We're actually repairing the disc. Doc, his second question when you're ready. Yes. When will this procedure become the standard practice? When will this procedure become the standard practice? Well, it already is the standard practice. Um, it's just not the standard practice everywhere. So just so you understand what a standard means, a standard means a treatment that is accepted. And um, it doesn't mean that it's done by everybody. It means that it's a reasonable, acceptable treatment. So for example, uh, fusion, you could say is a standard, is a standard treatment, but so is artificial discs. So which one of them is the standard? Well, they're both the standard. Some surgeons would choose fusion and some would choose artificial discs, some would choose endoscopic disc repair. So there's really more than one choice for patients, but of those three, this is the very best. So when will it become more widespread? Great question. Look at the tear right there. Oh, that's so perfect for a tear. You can see the white fibers of the annulus. Then you got the blue stain of the nucleus that's stuck in the annulus and then white fibers of the annulus. And that's the tear. That is the annular tear that we're here to debris. Every single patient has it. It's just really easy to see in this patient because it's kind of fresh. It's a newer tear. I think she fell. Didn't she fall at some point? 2012. Well, this injury is, um, the herniation looks younger than that. Now, oh. So we're finding out a little more history on this patient. I can't give you too many details, but let's just say that she had uh, hip problems and as a result of her hip problems, she fell. That was in 2012. So it's possible she made the tear in 2012, but a lot of the herniation is fresh like within the last year or two. So 10 year old annular tear, but more recent herniation. All right, question number three. Okay, doc, is, can you hear me doc? Okay. Is this the permanent fixed action rather than fusion procedure? Yeah, is this the permanent fix rather than fusion? Absolutely, this is a permanent fix. Our patients that I've done 16 years ago when I started, they're still doing great. Um, can you re-injure this disc? Yes, patients certainly do re-injure their discs. As a matter of fact, our tally is at 1%. One out of 100 of the surgeries I've done, they've re-herniated and they needed another surgery. So is it permanent in the sense that it can re-herniate? No. But if you follow the instructions, it won't re-herniate. And if you don't re-herniate, it is permanent. Is fusion permanent? Well, how many people have had fusions to go on to have another fusion? And then another fusion. Have you ever heard of adjacent segment disease? So with fusion surgery and artificial disc surgery, there's plenty of cases where patients have the fusion and then have to have a second fusion or third fusion or fourth fusion. So that's really not a permanent fix to me. It's not permanent when you have to keep doing it over and over again. But with the Duke laser disc repair, it is permanent and we don't get adjacent segment disease because we're not changing the biomechanics of the spine. We're keeping the natural movement of the spine. Therefore, there is no adjacent segment disease because there's no fusion or artificial disc being done. Ah, thought we wiped that. I don't know if that answers the question, but I think it does. Great job, by the way, Chet. There's more tear right there. That's kind of the end of the tear. So we're gonna clean this up, and by debriding the tear, it'll allow the disc to reheal. What's keeping the disc from healing now is the blue stuff stuck in the tear, which is the nucleus propulsus, the herniation itself. 
this is what other doctors don't do. And this is why people end up having problems even after spine surgery is because they didn't get a debridement of the tear. When you clean the tear properly, it'll heal properly and not be a problem in the future. This is so scarred here. This part is definitely older. I'm feeling a lot of scar tissue in this herniation here. As I've said many times before, everyone's herniation isn't just one single event, it's multiple events. Grab her. Over time. So every time they do something like bend over and pick something up heavy, they re-herniate another piece and then that squeezes out more herniation. They get more inflammation and then you get more pain. So it's a vicious cycle of partial healing, some abatement of their symptoms, and then a recurrence or recrudescence of the symptoms. All right, so we're almost done here at L34. I'm very happy with the progress that we're making. And I'm just cleaning up the tear laterally. Right here, there's still some herniation there. I'm gonna have to grab that out. Had some really good questions. Doc, I got another question from YouTube, from uh -huh. Whiteside91. Yes. Where do you aim the needles? Ah, where do I aim the needles? Great question. So the goal is to put the needle through the herniation. If you think about it, I'm trying to spear the herniation, okay? So by going through the herniation and the tear, the, am I, is my irrigation okay? Okay. By aiming for the herniation and the tear, then I know when I enter the disc, I'm not gonna cause any damage because the damage is already there and I'm not creating new damage. I'm just going through the old damage. So my goal is to do as least damage as possible. So when I'm aiming the needles, I'm looking for the path that will give me the least damage, new damage to the patient, right? If you think about it, surgeons are so used to thinking about their surgeries as they don't even think about it as damaging the patient, but they do damage the patient. They just consider it necessary damage as part of the surgery. We don't talk about it. That's why this endoscopic surgery is so amazing because you're not creating any new damage except for the cut on the skin. That's the only new damage I'm creating. Other than that, I'm passing through the muscles by s squeezing them apart and then putting them back together when I'm done, okay? We call it dilation. So I aim for the herniation and beyond that, as terms of what do I aim along the way, that's very technical. It's very difficult for me to describe it all right here, but um, I guess the easiest thing to say is I aim for the facet and then I kind of slide down the facet anterior and medial to get into the disc through the foramen. That's my little trick. It works quite well. All right, just about done on this disc and then we're gonna I guess try, uh, I wonder if I should do the other side. Yeah, Luis wants me to do the other side first. He thinks, uh, I think it might be a good idea. So I'll switch sides briefly and then I'll come back. By the way, that's bone right there. That whole surface is the end plate, the bone of the vertebral body. There's the other end plate up there. A lot of scar tissue. But this is where the herniation was here. This whole cavity now that I've created is, is the herniation's gone. All this here was the herniation. We have another question, doctor, from Sear on Facebook. Does this procedure help with foramenal stenosis and can you explain what foramenal stenosis is? Yeah, sorry about that. I should have answered that earlier. Um, yes, foramenal steno stenosis means narrowing. Foramenal stenosis is narrowing of the neural foramen, where the nerves come out. 
And this, this is where we are right here. We're in the foramen now. So we're at the beginning of the foramen, right at the back of the disc. And the reason the, the, the foramen gets narrowed is the disc here, where the blue line is, is inside the disc. The jelly squeezes out and then sits right here and narrows the hole where the nerve comes out. So this, uh, every herniated disc that goes into the foramen or central canal causes stenosis. The most common cause of spinal stenosis is herniated discs. Maybe the other cause that's common is the facet joints. And the facet joints are the joints behind the disc. And they can get enlarged over time. And when they do, they can also cause narrowing of the foramen, but from the back. So um, herniated discs cause neuroforaminal stenosis or narrowing of the foramen in the front of the foramen. And the uh, facet joint hypertrophy and arthropathy causes narrowing of the foramen at the back of the foramen. So I'll explain that in just a minute. Again, let me show you guys. I just want to finish irrigating this. How's she doing? So we're just using a little antiseptic in there to clean everything. And again, I'm going to go to the other side and then come back to this side. So. You have a pin? You want a pin? Yes, sir. So can you guys see over here? Can we turn the light on so they can light see? On, please. Can you see okay? Right here where my pin is? Hello, Flynn. Yes, we can see, Doc. All right, so here's a bone. There's a disc. And there's another bone here, right? And then there's this posterior elements, like the pedicle and the facet joint, that run behind. Okay? So you see this hole right here? That's the neural foramen. That's where the nerve comes out. Now the disc is in the front. So a herniated disc will push back and narrow the foramen at the front of the foramen. Whereas an, an arthritic facet joint will get big over time and narrow the foramen from the back. So the nerve that comes out of this hole can get pinched in the front by the herniation or pinched in the back by the facet. What I'm doing is I'm removing the herniation to unpinch the nerve in the front. I hope that makes sense. That's the best I can do right here, right now. You ready? So I'm switching to her right because I was able to get into L4-5 on the right side. And I really want to make sure I get in there and clean that right side out. And then that will make the L4-5 disc a little more mobile. And I could actually get the other needle in while I have the dilator in there. Oh, 5-1. Watch your finger. Louise said I was about to stick it in the wrong hole. All right, shot. Figuratively, but, you know, we were going to get to them all anyway. Shot. Shot. All right, good. So the guide wire is at 4.5 in the disc space nicely. And now we're going to come down again with the dilator, which will spread the tissues apart gently, causing no damage. So when I'm done, the only damage I've created with this whole surgery is that little 7 millimeter cut. That's the beauty of this transforaminal endoscopic surgery. I did not create transforaminal endoscopic surgery. Dr. Parvis Kamen did it at Pittsburgh. He was the first one to do it. And he tried teaching it, but unfortunately, a lot of, uh, it was really difficult. They didn't have the right tools at the time. They didn't have the right um, everything. I was gonna say anesthesia. I'll wait. Lay still, you're fine. Yeah, this is the bad disc. 
Let me know when I can proceed. She's definitely ventilating well. Look, you got to look at the silver lining, right? She's ventilating well. Anytime you feel like you're a cast member of the movie Scream, you, you're definitely ventilating well. <laughs> How are we doing, Doc? Can I proceed or wait a few more minutes? All right, so this is on a scale of one to 10, this L45 is definitely a high level complexity and difficulty. Um, it's so hard to even get into these things, even when I do a full open surgery shot and this patient is not any easier I can tell you that right now shot whoa there it is we opened it up that is awesome I love seeing that huh that's what I'm that's what I'm gonna do that's why I'm doing it this way now that we've got the bones apart from each other, now I'm going to put this one in. That was the whole point. But now I can't really see it as well either. So. so what I'm saying, put, put the there it is. Here. It's going in. No. Huh? Put the dilator already here. Or no? The dilator here? Yeah. Another one here. Oh, Sean? Yeah. You know, it's not a bad idea. Let's do it. Can I have Luis has a good idea, as always. All right, so our dilator is there, and uh, we're in the disk space. I don't know if you guys, if you want to rewind a little bit, not now, but you can see how the bones are now separated. We literally uh, separated them, yeah. So we've got a nice opening now to work with. All right, let's get this uh, uh, tube over. Now, for those of you who hasn't seen this before, this is actually the tube we're doing the surgery through. It's literally the size of a, a milkshake straw. And she's doing fantastic. She's stable. She's uh, comfortable at this point. Um, shot. Let's see where my tube is. Yeah, so I'm up by the facet joints. Doc, could I read a statement? Sorry? Can I read a statement? Yes. From Facebook, Siri. I'm sitting here tearing up with him answering my questions because I'll be getting with him when I get my MRI next week. I have, a, I have been a lot of pain for years and he seems to care for his patients. I want yeah. to thank you, Dr. Duke, and look forward to getting with you. You give me a lot of hope. Can you see what I'm doing? Thumbs up. That's why we're here. We're here to teach, you know, and for people to see the truth. I think we're in. Yeah. Actually, we just use that dilator. Right? Well, my concern is melting from the laser. Oh, no, we're not going to. We're not going to melt it. I'll stay away from it. So Luis brought up a great point. Let's see where we are. Perfect. So the tube is in the disc. I'm so happy. This was the worst level, by the way, L45. Not just because it's uh, slipping, but because it had the biggest herniations. And I feel pretty good about what we're doing right now. Oh, you can see that. See the guide wires inside the disc space yeah. through the tube. You see that, guys? Pretty awesome. So we're going to. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. We're going to take this out and leave the guide wire in. So needle coming off, guide wire staying. And once again, very difficult uh, level to treat because of how collapsed it is, how slipped it is, how big the herniation is. But we have just opened the foramen by another 20% by shoving the herniation down. Let's see what you got. All right, looking good. So we need to attack this. A little bit more like this. Shot. 
you can see the, the dilator is going along the guide wire. So the guide wire creates like a train track for the dilator and it keeps us away from, you know, going in weird places we don't want to be. We want to just make sure we guide this instrument into where it needs to be. And now it's working beautifully. I'm so excited for this patient. And she didn't want a fusion. She really didn't want a fusion. Take that. She, uh, she found out about us. She traveled. Can't remember where she traveled from, but pull that out. Huh? Oh, India Atlantic is kind of local. All right, well, let's get in there and see what we've got. We had to improvise a little bit today. So if you're a regular watcher, you notice we don't do this, but we're doing bilateral four five. So I couldn't get the other needle in because it was so collapsed and I was bumping up against the back of L4. So we just put the, we knew the needle was in on the, the right side. So we switched sides, went over here. Let's get the blue towel. And we got everything into the disc space, opened the bones up, and now I was able to get the other side in. So kind of cool. All right, did I answer all the questions? Yes. All right, good. So here we are at the uh, L45 disc. Oh, man, look at that. There's the dilator from the other side. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Louise said, yeah, is that going to get in the way? I'm like, nah, it'll be fine. So we should be okay, but let's see. All right. So that's actually coming in from the opposite side. How cool is that? You see it? You see the dilator in there? But this is the right way to do it. Louise came up with this idea. I give him credit. We, we do things here as a team. So, you know, I don't always have the best ideas. But, um, huh? Yeah, but at least we're done with that part now, right? So we don't have to. Yeah. Don't get any ideas. Now, if this laser hits that tube, the dilator, it will melt it. For those of you who are like, oh, can a laser get rid of bone spurs? Absolutely. It can melt steel. I don't want to melt the tube, so I'm trying to work around it. But um, those tubes are expensive. Those things are expensive. And once you ruin it, it doesn't work anymore. So, all right. So far, everything's going well here for the young lady. That's, that's a more calcified herniation right there. You can see the golden color of calcium. Let's grab that out if I can. Here, grab her. I think that's a herniation right there. Look at the ingrowth of the blood vessel right there. You guys see that? All right. Look at look at that herniation. Pro look at the ingrowth off to the side there, right right there. Uh, I can't even point to it. Give me the laser. Look at the blood vessels right right in this area. Let's see if I can point to it. Just right there, below the tip. You see the blood vessels growing into the herniation? That's why herniations get inflamed, right, right off to the side. That's why they hurt so much. There's a neovascularization. All right, let me grab it out. Is she doing all right? So if there's more questions, just feel free to ask me, Chet. 
Don't wait for me to prompt you. Will do. All right, so we've already done three, four on the left. Now we're doing four or five on the right, and we're gonna come back later and do four or five on the left. Because we're doing a bilateral four or five because she had narrowing of both foramens, left and right at four or five, by, with massive herniation, so. Actually, Crystal, can you open the other one that you showed me? Yeah, please. The other what? Yeah, the other set. What? The other set, yeah. Why? Because in that case, you can stay there, do five, and then this one is ready for the other last one. Sure. Oh yeah, I see. Yeah. Because we're tying up a yeah, dilator. Yeah, yeah. In that case it's calm about yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. As usual. Oh yeah. Is that her? She comfy? No. All right. Well, this had to be done, and I'm really hoping this is going to work well for her. I think she's been putting this off for a long time. You know, nobody wants to get fused. They're all terrified of it because there's so many horror stories that go along with fusions. I've been in so many of these listhesis you know, with open surgery over the years, fusing, putting a cage in here. And uh, it's pretty remarkable to do this without fusing. Okay, let's see. Sure. Thank you. So those fibers at the roof there are um, posterior longitudinal ligament. This is all herniated disc right here. So we got one more surgery after this today, and that's going to be, oh, I hey, hit the, did I hit it right there? Hard to say. We've got one more surgery. It's going to be another lumbar Duke laser disc repair. Pretty good size herniation. Grab her. All right. We're just wrapping it up on this side. Almost done. Looking pretty good. If you've watched our endoscopic um, rhizotomies, that we do, we have a couple of them now on the YouTube channel, there we go. And those endoscopic rhizotomies are pretty cool. Some of the patients we treat have screws and rods in their spine. And you know, the screws go in right where the facet joint is. So if you go and watch some of those, oh yeah, that's a herniation right there. If you go and watch some of them, you can actually see the screws with the endoscope right at the facet, there's a herniation. So we're just kind of picking out this herniation a little bit at a, a little pieces at a time. Unfortunately, that's typically how it is. I wish it all came out at once, make my job easier. But quite often you just gotta work on it, get as much out as you can. The other thing that people don't know usually is it's impossible to get all the herniation out. Nobody can do 100%. So it's 
So what you do is you go for as much as you can. A lot of scar tissue there. Just about done here. Finishing up touches. And then I'm gonna do... Doc, we got a question from Facebook from Siri. From Siri? I didn't hear, who is it from? Siri. Oh, okay, sure. When you are done with this procedure, do you do another MRI to make sure you got it all to see if it's off the canal or the nerves? If I, when I'm done with my surgery, do I get another MRI to make sure that I got it all and that it's off the nerves? No, there's no reason to do that. Um, nobody does MRIs after they do surgery unless you're trying to remove a tumor, like a brain tumor or something. And then you'll get an MRI. But we don't do uh, MRIs after spine surgery typically. We'll do a X-ray or a CT scan if we're putting in screws and rods. But when you're doing just a decompression or a annular debridement, those are not things you can see on the MRI. The patient has to tell you, you know, if they're having relief or not. And um, you have to do an exam. You got to examine the patient and see if there's issues. Yeah. So for example, um, I always examine my patients to see, are, is their strength come back? Has their strength returned? You know, or if they have numbness, you know, is that better? So there's the nerve root up there. Um, you can see it right there. It's that white thing. It's kind of the dura around it. And the herniation is pretty much gone. I may be able to get a little more right there. She okay? Yeah. She's a little lighter than I want her. All right. That looks that looks good. That looks good. That's just a little small osteophyte. So we're done here on this side. I'm going to take all this stuff out and we're going to go to the other side. She okay? So we're just putting a little antiseptic. Oh, really? Look at that. I injected the betadine on this side, guys. Look at that. And it can, can you see this? The betadine went out the other side. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Right. Yeah. Luis is the man with the plan. Everything okay? Take. Let me have the roller. Roly poly. All right. So we're done here on the right L45. Gonna apply a little pressure to the muscles. Now, what are we doing next? 5-1. Five, one. Five, one. All right. Single left. Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, is the last one two levels? I thought there were another four level. When do we have all the four levels? Is that third? We have four levels on Thursdays? Oh. So the, we're just kind of going over the schedule for Thursday, two days from now. We've got a four, I know we got a four level cervical. We have four level cervical. I think we have two four level ones, or we have a thoracic. Oh, I have a thoracic two level. That's right. We're doing a thoracic disc herniation, guys. Yeah, it's T11, 12, T12, L1, or something like that. It will be our 16th. And Joe just got another one signed up today. So basically, we're treating thoracic disc herniations as well that, that are painful. Jordan, great job. Is that where we are? Yes, sir. All right. So we're going to do 5 1 next. Let's go do it. Take.
this double dilator thing. It brings me back to my right. It, it reminds me of my my youth. Huh? No, no. There was something that I was introduced to as a young child in California, and it had something to do with King Kong. <laughs> the rest I'll leave to your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, you guys behave. All right. So we're at we're at five one. <laughs> yeah. Everything is Luis's. Everything is Luis's fault. All right. So we're working on the last disc number. Five one at this point. Let's get the dilator back. I mean the guide wire back. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're good. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So we've left the dilator in the left side at 4.5 because I'm going to come back to that. That's going to be the last thing I do. And uh, we'll be able to clean out that disc nicely. Shot. Ah, I don't want that. Kind of slipped back a little bit there. There's a lot of pressure here in this disc. You see that? Let me see that shot. Yeah, I can't advance this without... Huh. Shot. Interesting. We talk about, gosh, look at that. Shot. We talk about inflammation. But look at that, just like coming back out. Back out. Yeah. Mm. Shot. All right. Keep her comfortable. I don't want her Valsalva. Shot. Uh. Shot. So there's so much pressure in this disc, it's literally pushing us out. Shot. And it's from inflammation, swelling. Shot. Right. I can't do any better than that. And literally, it's pushed the dilator out. Unbelievable. How's she doing? Good. All right. So inflammation causes swelling. We know that. And the disc is swollen for sure. And that's probably a large part of her pain. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. Great news. So we're going to get in there and we're going to remove what's causing all the swelling is this herniation the blue stuff is just irritating the hell out of the annulus fibrosis and that irritation causes inflammation and the inflammation is what causes the swelling and the swelling is probably what's causing her pain so inflammatory swelling in a confined space think about it almost like a compartment syndrome you know, affecting your arm or leg where you have swelling in a confined fascial space. It's extremely painful. And of course, there are nerves involved because this patient has nerves. All patients have nerves in their disc. Not just the nerves behind the disc, but nerves in the disc. All right. All the blue is abnormal. It's degenerating nuclear nucleus propulsus. So we've got this disc to do, and then we're going to do L45 on the patient's left side. That's all that's left. She good? You happy? Yes? 
All right, so let me just wrap this side up. This won't be too long. Any more questions from our audience? Yes, Doc. We got a question from YouTube from Tom. What's that blue stuff? Oh, the blue stuff is a dye I injected in her disc. It's um, called indigo carmine. And it's a vital dye. It stains to um, nucleus propulsus that's degenerated. So not normal nucleus, but degenerated nucleus. That's all it binds to here in the disc area. It doesn't bind to bone. It doesn't bind to ligaments. It doesn't bind to anything but abnormal degenerated nucleus herniation, basically. And that's why we use it. It helps me visualize how much degenerative disc disease and inflammation is going on. That's a lot. Okay, there's a lot going on there. That's a whole wall of just diseased material. So it's a great way to see the um, degenerated nucleus propulsus. And that's been known by other doctors to use this. I was taught to use it by Dr. Uh, uh, Young, Anthony Young, my ment one of my mentors. He was my mentor for lumbar. Uh, the Koreans were my main mentors for cervical. All right, look right there. See that? That's nucleus propulsus, that white thing. But that is not degenerated. So this blue stuff is the damaged one, and the other one is not damaged. So I'm going to leave that white stuff alone. That's, that's why we do the stain. You can see the tear happened below here, right through here. But it didn't go through this part. So the blue dye is really good for seeing the tear. Just about done. See the pink? That's inflammatory tissue. That's what we're here to get rid of. Yeah, we're going to do the left side next. And then we're done. We got about 10 more minutes. I'm just about done here. I hope you're enjoying this live stream on April 5th, 2022. And uh, I want to thank my amazing team, both in the operating room and out for doing a great job of getting these patients taken care of. Everybody here makes sacrifices, and uh, I really appreciate it. And we have fun, you know? We cut jokes from time to time, right, Luis? Now, Berndez, listen to me. When I'm gone, you make sure you make sure that Luis gets some time off. You hear me? And if you see him around here when he's not supposed to be, you you call the police. <laughs> call the police. Good, good. Thank you for doing that. You're not thinking about doing all that stuff here, are you? <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. You know, we should get Jong to come here and do some cases. All right, we're done. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I've heard. You're doing a great job. Take that. Let's see if we can see the nerve. I always like to see the nerve if we can, but now it's embedded in all that fat. Why is there so much fat around the nerve? Anybody know? Any takers? I know Luis knows. It's normal to have fat around the nerve, the nerve root. What's over there 
I mean, it really takes a sophisticated level of knowledge. Huh? Well, that's the myelin sheath, but why would a nerve, are nerves highly metabolically active? Yes. And what part of the nerve is right there in the foramen? Anybody know? Luis? The dorsal root ganglion. It's all the neurons that are involved in transmission of sensory information from the leg up to the spinal cord and brain. So basically you got all these hungry nerves, cell bodies right there in the foramen using energy, massive amounts of energy. And that's why you have fat. Can the, can the brain use fat for energy? Oh, good job. No, the brain cannot use fat. The only thing the brain uses for energy is sugar, glucose. But nerves, nerves are not part of the brain and they can actually use fat, even ketone bodies. All right, just some interesting trivia. Structure function. But it also pads the nerves, you know, it gives padding, but it also gives energy. So it serves purposes. That's why that's why I have so much fat, is you know, I'm trying to pad my nerves and conserving energy. You never know when Karen's going to forget to order pizza for lunch. All right, shot. Okay, so you can see the tube is at the facets. We're going to go past. You want me to wait a minute? Is she, you want to put her deeper or is she good? You happy with her? Yes? No, maybe so? Happy or? All right, done. Beautiful. So we've lost about five cc's at most, maybe four or five cc's of blood. So had this patient had open back surgery, we would have had to make an incision that's about 10 inches long and there would have been massive amounts of bleeding but we've done the surgery basically bloodless and the pain meds that people take for the surgery afterwards is for one night they take a muscle relaxer and an anti-inflammatory that's it so there's no narcotics used so this is safe surgery because it's outpatient there's no narcotics used i need to see the scope up there guys I need irrigation. Good. All right, there we go. All right, what's that red thing? Anybody know? That's a blood clot. It's not a blood vessel, it's a blood clot. But good guess. First time I ever saw one, I said the same thing. It's a blood vessel. But it's a blood clot. It's a good sign that her blood is clotting, which we always want, of course. All right, any more questions from the audience? This will be our last disc. It's gonna be the left four five. No, Doc. Thank you. Is the laser on? Are you ready? Okay, good. The reason we have a little more oozing um, is because we're getting the bleeding from the other side, which we already fixed, by the way. But it's gonna shake up a lot of the Blood clots. Grab her. Uh, I got five minutes, maybe 10 max. All right, so wait, let's look around a little bit. This is where the problem area is gonna be right there. That's the tear, that's the herniation. All right, we've got one more surgery after this for those of you diehard fans of the Duke Spine Institute. That will be a two level, I'm understanding. Is that correct? Okay. 
I got three minutes, maybe five max. How are we doing on irrigation? I'm starting to see bubbles. Are we okay? I'm gonna need a grabber so I can see. All right, so I'm putting the grabber in. There's a bone spur. I wanna get a better look at what I'm dealing with. There it is. The reason we broadcast live is so people can ask questions and they can actually see the surgery. Of course, if we broadcast it after the surgery was over, you wouldn't be able to ask questions to me while I operate. So I like to give people the opportunity to ask questions while we're operating. And by the way, this is the same method of training we use to train surgeons. Surgeons are come into the operating room with the, with the chief surgeon and they get to uh, be there kind of watching what's happening through the eyes of the surgeon and learn. So that's why I created this program eight years ago where we broadcast our surgeries live so the general public can actually learn by watching. That's a piece of herniation I'm going to have to get out. Laser, standby. Why does the mouth have tissue in it? Just a couple of minutes and we'll be done. I'm just putting the final touches. There's a hard kind of bone spur right there. It doesn't want to come out. I just want to take another peek, see what's going on. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I need to get that area right there. Let's take a look over here. That looks like a little bit of herniation. Um, about 30 seconds till I'm done. Let me have the grabber. Yeah, we're almost done. You're doing great. Hang in there, sweetheart. About finished. Yeah. Let me take a peek. I feel like there's something right there, so let me see what I can do. Yeah, that's that big part of that big foraminal herniation she had. It's just sitting underneath the nerve. Uh, sorry. Just give me another minute or two.
Let's see that laser. I think I can clean this up with the laser a little better than the grabber. Yep. She won't like it, but this is gonna be good for her. I mean, she won't like it right now. She'll like it later. I need to move that. Move your hand somewhere. I got to get the fiber in the right place. Help me. Swing it one way or the other. Yeah, that's fine. Right there. Yep. see the grabber seems like there's one more piece there if I can get that I'll be very satisfied That looks good. That looks good. Alright, we're done. Good, nice on please. I'm happy with that. That's good work. Good team, good job team. Alright, a little antiseptic. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> thought I could do a little improvement on the process but that didn't work yeah let me have that other one I need, I need that irrigation yeah what's the issue yep we'll be right with them just is it bilateral or anything Well, I'll be out there in a minute anyway. All right, we're done, folks. We fixed uh, three discs on two sides and four different spots. So. And yeah, we all did well. I'm very happy. She did well. The anesthesiologist did really well. We all did a good job. Let's get these incisions closed. So let's take a look here. Chet, you want to show the audience how we did this? You see that tiny little cut? Chet? Yes, Doc, I'm zooming yeah. in. Yeah. The whole surgery was done through this seven millimeter little incision. We have one on the right, one on the left. She's a really fit lady, so she's going to appreciate not having her whole back destroyed with spine, open spine surgery. We did this endoscopically, so she's going to do great. She still has the listhesis. But like I've said, um, I've been able to eliminate probably well over 200 patients with spondylolisthesis with back pain. I've been able to get rid of their back pain and not touch the spondylolisthesis, leave it alone. That's because the spondylolisthesis doesn't cause back pain. You all set, Luis? So, and because we're not d going in the back and disrupting her ligaments on her spine or bones, we're not doing a laminectomy, so we're not destabilizing her spine in any way. So she can actually have this procedure done and not need the fusion because we're not messing with her natural spine. All right, and if you have questions, type them up. I'll be happy to answer them for you. And we've got one more surgery to go in about 45 minutes. I'm gonna call our EBL five mil.
Dr. Ardick Majin here at Duke Spine Institute. It's Groundhog Day, I believe, right? February 2nd, so 2-2-2020. Severe lower back pain, which turned into sciatica, and it was down my left leg constantly. I slept about two, three hours a night at most, and I could not sit for more than five minutes, and I had to be standing up. And did you try some other treatments in Tennessee or elsewhere? I did. I, you know, when this whole thing started and it was a bad flare, I thought I'll be able to work through this chiropractic, physical therapy, two spinal injections, massage therapy. And how did you know those treatments did not work for you? I had no relief um, at all. My, my sleeping continued to get worse and my, my pain was never better. And do you have relief now? Absolutely. I, I would say I have 95% relief. Awesome. And, uh, it, it's amazing. I, after surgery yesterday, I put on a back brace. I walked out of here. I sat down yesterday for probably over an hour and had lunch. Last night, um, in bed, I had zero pain. It's, it's a miracle. Well, we're very happy that you're doing so well. And your surgery was a great one because we um, fixed two discs. You had herniated disc at L45, L5S1. And you can see in this footage right here that we grabbed the herniation out. And it was one of the herniations was really big. And it was really gratifying to get it out because it was resting on your sciatic nerve. Once we took it out, I think your sciatic nerve probably uh, felt a sigh of relief. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and the surgery went very well. The laser debridement of the annulus went well. And I feel like your pain's going to be gone. It's not going to come back. I would agree. All right, very absolutely. good. Well, is there anything else you want to tell uh, your viewers? Folks, if, if you're suffering and you're not getting relief from from those uh, non-invasive therapies, then come see Dr. Duke and have him look at your MRI and, and give a diagnosis. And uh, if you need to have surgery, come down here. He will take good care of you and so will his team. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Dr. R. Duke Mason. It's January 26, 2022, and I'm here with one of my patients who you underwent the Duke laser disc repair on your lower back for some herniated discs about a week ago. Yes. How are you feeling today? Unbelievable. For almost three years, I had lower back pain, and um, it just, you know, it just nags at you, wears you out. And then I came here. And you were the first one. I went to two other surgeons and neither one of them picked up what was wrong with me, even though I had the MRI. And you came in and you told me exactly what was going on and you performed the laser surgery and I'm like a different person yeah. a week later. Yeah, you were a different person the next day. Right? The day oh, after oh, you had yeah. no pain, remember? No, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So that pain's gone for the rest of your life. How does that make you feel? New life. Good. And, you know, a long time ago, I remember when people did something great, they, you said, what are you going to do now? They said, I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> you already left, I could see. No, my <laughs> wife's a big <laughs> Disneyland fan. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> All right. So, sounds like we helped you with your back pain, and it sounds like you're very satisfied. Oh, yeah. I'm recommending a, a friend of mine in Connecticut to come here. You have to come here. If, if you go anywhere else, I really think you're going to be wasting your time. So this guy just looks at you and he can tell what, what needs to be done. He's just, he's a fantastic talent and I'm very grateful that uh, I came here. Well, we're grateful you did too because it's going to change your life for the, for the better. Congratulations. Thank you, Doc. You're welcome. Good morning, I'm Dr. Duke Mage, and I'm here with one of my patients, and you traveled to Duke Spine Institute here in Florida from where? Uh, New York, Poughkeepsie, New York. Awesome. And why did you come from New York to Duke Spine here in Florida? 
because uh, I heard that this was the best place for me to go. What kind of problems were you having that you needed to come here? I had lower back problems and numbness in my leg, which was my left leg. This was the best place for me to come. Okay, so you had back pain, sciatica down your left leg, pain shooting down the left leg. Yes. And that was just yesterday, right? When Cor you yes, had that. that's correct. Yep. And, and what, do you still have your back pain today? No more back pain. <laughs> it's gone? Gone. And is that because we have you doped up on powerful painkillers? Nope, none no, it isn't. Did anybody in New York offer you spine surgery to fix your back? Yep, yes they did. Yeah. And they wanted to fuse it. Yeah. And you've had surgery before. You had a microdiscectomy, um, and that helped you for a little while. Yes. But the symptoms came back. Came back. Yeah. All right, well, they're not going to come back this time. So what do we do to make your pain go away? You fix my back. You did oh. arthroscopic. That's right, arthroscopic spine surgery called the Duke Laser District there. So leg pain's gone, back pain's gone. Everything is gone. You're happy? You did, oh, I'm very happy. You're smiling. Yeah, I'll tell you. Congratulations. Thank yeah. you so much. We did it all through a seven millimeter incision, just that big. And you can actually watch that video right here in animation to see what it looks like to do the Duke Laser Disc Repair. A Band-Aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. So now that your surgery is done, what are you going to do? I'm going to go home and enjoy my life. Good for you. Enjoy my life. Congratulations. I'm very happy. Anything you want to tell your, your viewers? Uh, other than this is the place to come, it's uh, worth the travel. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic neck pain. The inflamed annular tear causes neck pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes arm pain. A Band-Aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. It can take up to 12 months. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and neck pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Duke Laser Disc Repair, a comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, degenerative discs, protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica. This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke laser disc repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion, and on the right, the least invasive Duke laser disc repair. The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke laser disc repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. 
the incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, fat tissue, and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke laser disc repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke laser disc repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, strips, and a band-aid. Total time for the Duke laser disc repair surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke laser disc repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. The Duke laser disc repair patient is soon back home enjoying life with a very fast recovery allowing normal activities without pain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours, with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen, in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke Laser Disc Repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. A large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke laser disc repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke laser disc repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. The Duke laser disc repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke laser disc repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With spinal fusions, Patients are required to take highly addictive narcotic painkillers, which can cause constipation, bowel, and bladder complications. Due to the minimal pain, narcotics are not needed with the Duke laser disc repair. Spinal fusions have a high risk for infection. The Duke laser disc repair has a very low risk for infection. In the seven years the Duke laser disc repair has been performed, there have been no infections. Spinal fusion surgery has a very long recovery and requires a great deal of physical therapy and time to heal from the trauma in the muscles and the spine itself. Whereas the recovery from Duke laser disc repair is in a matter of hours or days, rather than weeks or months. With fusion, the spine is being fused together, losing movement. Whereas there is no fusion with the Duke laser disc repair, normal movements of the joints in the spine is preserved. 
Spinal fusion results in loss of mobility. There is no mobility loss with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. In fact, most Duke Laser Disc Repair patients experience improved mobility after the surgery. The Duke Laser Disc Repair is FDA approved. All the instruments and equipment used are FDA approved. This proprietary surgery itself has been peer reviewed and published and is performed exclusively at the Duke Spine Institute. With the highest published success rate of 95%, the Duke Laser Disc Repair is proven to be the most successful and least damaging spinal surgery in the world for the treatment of symptomatic damaged discs causing back pain, neck pain, sciatica, and radiculopathy due to herniated, degenerated, or bulging discs. All right, Dr. Ara Duke Majin here. We have just completed a very complicated endoscopic surgery on a patient's lower back for lumbar disc disease, and I'll call it lumbar disc disease because I, I like that word. It is all encompassing, and it really just means a problem with the disc that causes disease. So what is disease? Well, disease is different than um, something called degeneration. And degeneration of a joint means the joint is structurally abnormal. It's basically um, breaking down, breaking apart, falling apart. But not all degeneration results in what's called disease. Disease is basically uh, negative sequela of either um, anatomical abnormalities or uh, physiological abnormalities in the body. And what I'm trying to say to you is um, quite simply that just because a disc looks bad on an MRI, it's damaged, it's herniated, degenerated, doesn't mean it causes symptoms. So the fact that a disc is degenerated and causes symptoms means disease. But if you have a disc that's degenerated without symptoms and it's, no, it's not causing any pain or pinched nerve or anything, then it's not diseased. So degenerative disc disease actually implies symptoms to the patient as a result of the disc degeneration. So um, disc disease or degenerative disc disease is a very broad term and it includes everything from herniated disc, annular tear, bulging disc, ruptured disc, collapsed disc, spondylosis, you know, anything that happens to a disc, including modic changes, which I don't want to go into. But um, the Duke laser disc repair surgery you just watched is, in my opinion, by far, without any, any question, it is the ultimate surgery for degenerative disc disease, which happens to affect hundreds of millions of people worldwide. So if we go to every country and every population around the world, there are quite literally hundreds of millions of people suffering from either neck pain or lower back pain or thoracic pain that uh, with or without involvement of the nerves or spinal cord that we call radiculopathy or myelopathy respectively there. And so they have symptomatic degenerative disc disease. And the vast majority of them get zero treatment because number one they live somewhere where they don't have access to a doctor that can actually tell them why they're suffering and that it's related to the discs number two they um they can't, they don't have the ability to get the treatment that even if it's recommended they just don't have access to it because of whether it's financial or whether it's um you know there's no hospital that has the equipment etc or the doctor or the training so there's a massive problem worldwide, people suffering with chronic debilitating back and neck pain that could be fixed quite easily with this procedure, the Duke Laser Disc Repair, but they don't have access to it you know, because they don't live here, they can't travel here, and I'm the one doing it here near Orlando, Florida right now in 2022. So someday, somebody asked me, will the Duke Laser Disc Repair be the standard of care? It already is the standard of care, but it's not widespread used. Okay, and there's lots of instances or examples of technology advances in medicine where that technology advance starts in one place, one geolocation, one city, one town, one hospital, one doctor. 
and that doctor creates a new technique or a new device that you know revolutionizes medicine and that's what this surgery is this duke laser disc repair annular debridement you know removal of the herniated disc is revolutionary because it literally cures back and neck pain that comes from a herniated disc or de degenerative disc disease now there are other causes of back and neck pain like the facet joints and just so you understand what i'm talking about i'm going to show you this model here there's two joints in the spine <clears throat> one joint is this big white thing called the disc and it's literally a joint between moving bones the other joint is behind the disc called the facet joint and uh, the picture is not so great but maybe that's the best we can do the facet joint is right here okay and you can actually see the bones moving at the facet joint right uh, right around there right where my fingertip is you see that see how they move there so there's movement in the spine at the disc and there's movement in the spine at the facet joint right there and I apologize for the quality of the image so pain can come wherever there's movement at whatever joint there's movement that's where pain comes from and we fix disc pain all the time with the Duke laser disc repair we fix facet joint pain all the time with rhizotomy um, there's another procedure that can be done to fix disc and facet pain it's fusion but um, most people don't want a fusion because they're so invasive so anyway, without further ado, the surgery went very well. Um, we were able to get everything done we set out to do. And I think this patient's gonna be very happy with her results. Now, I know we have some questions, so let's start with the first one, Chet. Why is this blurry? Is the blood making it blurry? So one of our viewers um, recognize that the quality of the picture during the surgery the endoscopic view was blurry at times and um, that's because there was some blood in the fluid that's in the tube and that blood uh, is going to obscure the view just like if you're you know looking at a fire and the wind blows the right way the smoke comes right at you and you cannot see because the smoke is in front of you so think about the blood bleeding in there as being like little blood smoke and it just it obscures your view that's why it was blurry another question is how many of these surgeries would you do in a day so the question was how many of these surgeries would you do in a day um that's a great question it all depends on whether or not i'm drinking red bull <laughs> if i have red bull on board I could probably do 10 of these surgeries in a day, but without Red Bull, maybe four or five. <laughs> I should get something from Red Bull for that. Um, you know, the surgeries we've done today so far are what are called multi-level. Multi-level means we're not just fixing one disc. We're fixing more than one disc. And the more levels we do, the more difficult the surgery is. It's very physically demanding. It's um, demanding on my staff, you know, because they get tired too. They're running around back there um, and they're doing an amazing job. They have to open sets, they have to clean sets, they have to sterilize things, and they have to set the room up, break it down, clean it up. We have to monitor the patients, recover the patients, innovate the patients. So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that you all don't see necessarily, but it happens in every hospital with every surgery center or uh, operating room and so there's a lot of work that goes on and people get tired we're all human could we have two shifts sure so if we got busier i could certainly hire a second shift that could actually work into the evening um, how many do i think i could do in a day i could probably do to 10 patients with two discs per patient that would be a total of obviously 20 discs today we did four plus four is eight plus three we did um we did uh 11 so far and we're doing two more so we're going to be doing 13 uh, by the end of the day could i do more i could do 20. so that would be another seven i would have to actually have a second room 
with a second anesthesiologist so we do have a second room and we did one of our cases today in the second room which is why you didn't see it but um, if I had two rooms with two anesthesiologists two full staff I could do I could do 10 cases in a day what other questions do we have one more question this needs to become more widely available uh, so there's somebody that either commented or questioned. Who is it? It's uh, Whiteside91 from YouTube. Whiteside91. 91. Whiteside91 from YouTube asked, could this or stated that this procedure should be more available? 100% agree. That's why we're broadcasting. We want our people to be aware that it's out there and that um, unfortunately your doctors are not going to talk about it because they don't do it. They never got trained on it. The, it's a newer technology. I had to literally leave my work and my family and go learn it. And I did that after I got done with my training as a resident and fellow. So it actually was um, extra training. And I'm not patting myself on the back, but what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, a lot of surgeons don't want to go learn new things. They want to learn what they learn in residency and training and then go into practice and they just do it. And so, um, some doctors are interested in learning new technologies and kind of keeping up and doing what's best for the patient. And so it takes one of those kind of doctors to actually do that. That said, there's a lot of um, resistance to this endoscopic surgery because, and I've said this a hundred times, maybe you can see this, those are screws and rods. And fusion surgery uses implants like screws and rods. And the the beneficiary of us doing screws and rods is the, is the uh, implant company because they sell those screws and rods for about $10,000 per disc. So if you're having three discs fixed, that's about $30,000 worth of screws, rods, and cages. And if you multiply that times a million surgeries, fusion surgeries done every year, just multiply, it's probably going to be around um, an average of $10,000 to $15,000 per surgery, fusion spine surgery, times 1 million cases. I don't even know what that number is, but it's billions. So what that tells you is that the um, companies that manufacture and sell screws and rods, and they promote the use of screws and rods to spine surgeons, and they promote it to them while they're just beginning their training for seven, six or seven years of spine training, they're there from day one. They're influencing these surgeons to put in screws and rods and cages. Why? Because they're in the acting in the best interest of the patient to make surgeons aware of their implants? No, they're doing it for business purposes. They want to stick that, they want the surgeons to stick all that metal in patients because they're making billions of dollars in profit every year. Do you? If this costs, if I charge you $10,000 for these screws and rods, do you really think it costs me $10,000 to make this? No, it probably costs quite literally 50 bucks to make this. And then they make $10,000 for a $50 investment. Now they're going to complain and say, oh, but we have to pay for the intellectual property rights. We have to pay for, you know, wages in India or wherever it is they're made. But the reality is, is even if you look at all their costs, their costs are well below $200. Their margins are 500% uh, easy. And so um, do they really need 500%? No, but in the end, it, business is business and I can't fix that, okay? But you guys can. People can demand spine surgery without implants. You can demand the Duke laser disc repair. And if you do it and more people do it, and more people turn away from screws and rods and cages and fusions, then um, it is going to become more popular and more well uh, widespread. All right, so somebody asked, what about the moaning and groaning, right? Screaming. Yeah, so the reason why patients could moan and groan during surgery is because they are awake. And why are they awake? Because we did not put a tube down. We don't do this particular surgery with a tube down. We do it with a patient um, on nasal cannula oxygen and what's called MAC, which is monitored anesthetic care or monitored airway. 
and basically um, we do propofol sedation. Why do we do it that way? Because I need that patient able to talk to me when I'm placing those needles into their spine because the reality is if I'm placing the needle in to the herniated disc, I'm going right past their nerve and the nerve is up here and I'm going down here. And so if I get too close to the nerve, I'll rub on it and they're gonna say, ah, I have pain in my leg. I need to know that because I gotta then move where I'm going and I gotta go lower, basically. And so for me to, um, to do the procedure safely, I have to have the patient awake. And because they're awake, we have to use propofol sedation. So it's the best we can do. We don't like the patients being awake, but it's necessary for their safety. That's why you hear them moaning and groaning sometimes. And um, the truth is, is that um, if the patient comes in and they're not on other medications for pain, like other drugs, let's just say other drugs, then they won't be awake. They'll be asleep the whole time. But when patients, um, when patients use other substances to help control their pain and their anxiety from pain, uh, I'll give you an example like alcohol, for example. A lot of people uh, partially treat or help treat their pain by alcohol. They drink, you know. They may drink, you know, a fifth of whiskey just to uh, dull the anxiety from their pain. They may do other drugs. They may vape. They may do marijuana. But the point is, is we're not here to judge them. But um, those other drugs can affect the propofol and how well it works. So when we see a patient where the anesthetic's not working the way we expect it to, we think there's something else that might be going on. Not, not always, but like some other drug that's where their liver is beefed up, they're able to metabolize the propofol differently. Point is, is that uh, we're here to help the patient get well and we can't detox every patient before they have surgery. So um, they're adults and they make choices for themselves. And in the end, either they get themselves off the other drugs before they come here and have surgery or they don't. And if they don't, well, they may end up not having, um, the, the anesthetic we use may not be as effective as we want it to be. So I hope that answers your question. Do we have any others? Yeah. I hope you enjoyed the surgery. Have a wonderful day.